All right. Welcome, everyone, to episode 14 of The Phoenix Report. I'm Jack Connor. Uh, this episode features a very special guest, someone who I have wanted to have on this show since day one. Now, my guest today is someone who I can honestly say has known me my entire life. She is someone I am very close to and always someone who, I've, who I have been able to come to for advice and encouragement. She is the eldest of five children, and despite coming from very humble beginnings and losing their father at a young age, managed to grow stronger in faith and love through the years, thanks in no small part to their incredible network of extended family and friends. Now, born and raised in a small town called Linwood, Pennsylvania, our guest today has lived all over the country and for many years was a stage actress and a singer. And all my life, she and I have had a very unique bond in that we have always had a passion and appreciation for performing and artistry and pursuing your dreams in a practical, realistic way. Now, next to my own parents, I can't imagine too many other people who have who have been as influential in my life in terms of looking at the world without such a generational gap that so many people tend to see things through. And that's something that has always stuck with me, and that's really what today's episode is about, family and legacy. Now, by now, you're probably wondering who this person is. Joining me here face-to-face is my aunt, my father's sister. This is the same aunt who I mentioned on the first episode of this podcast, She is the one who gave me my first Beatles tape when I was 11, and she recently flew in all the way from her home in Tucson, Arizona, so I really wanted to have her on, even if she's a little bit nervous about putting herself out there like this. So please welcome to the Phoenix Report, my aunt, Maureen O'Connor Petke. Yeah. Hello, my darling. (laughs) How are you feeling so far? I feel fine. Yeah, did you like that intro? Oh, Jack, it was magnificent. I figured you would. Yes. Now, thank I mean, you for the compliments. Oh well, I, I meant every word of it. You know, <laughs> I it's. Um, I know that the other day I ca- kind of had to explain to you what what podcasting was, and that it's sort of like, it's sort of like a radio show, like sort of like an interview, but it's a little bit more. Uh, a little bit more intimate, a little bit more conversational, because it's not like your traditional interview where I'm trying to get you to promote something, or yeah. we have to like fill a certain segment, or you know, this is just um, this is just a normal conversation it's an you know, that, that we have, of and, exactly. Yes, and something that we can document, something that we can have for years and years and years, oh, and um, so I th- I thought it would be a good thing because especially because you have an interesting life story, and I figured that my friends and the people who listen to this thing might be interested in hearing that. And um, certainly other members of our family will be in, you know, tuning in as well. Not to put you on the spot, but I, 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 think, uh, I think they'll get a, get a real kick out of it. And um, you know, one of the things I've always been curious about, and you and I have talked about a lot about this over the years, is sort of our family's history. Like why, you know, why and how we came over to America from, from Ireland. You mentioned um, your grandfather, my great grandfather, Jack O'Connor, who was uh, you, you. You described him as being active in the movement. In the uh, in, you know, meaning he was he lived for a while in Northern Ireland, and I guess he was involved in the IRA somehow. I don't know exactly what the details were, and I don't know. I don't know how much you were told back in the day, but may, maybe some things are better left unsaid. I don't know. I don't. I don't want to open up a can of worms, but uh, but I know that there was a reason why he and his wife, Annie Donnelly, came came to the States uh, years ago. And, uh, wh- and, and your other, uh, the other side of the family, my mother, mm-hmm. Mary O'Connor, Mary McKenna O'Connor, yeah. her father came over from Scotland. Right. And uh, he, they were actually all born in Ireland, but when the potato famine hit, they all went to Scotland. Right, right, because I, I, I know that I know that my nana was born in Scotland. Yes. But her parents were Irish, and then but but she spent most of her life here, yeah, here she, in the states. She, she was an, she was here at three years old. Oh, okay, so they yeah. came over on the boat. It, it's always interesting, and you see like websites out there like Ancestry.com and yes. stuff like that, and that's why I, I'm just I'm fascinated by that stuff because it's where mm-hmm. we came from, and it's like if we don't talk about it, then no one's going to know. Yeah. And so I'm you know. How much? Um, how I, I mean? How much do you know about the circumstances about why the McKennas and the O'Connors ended up coming 
coming over? Well, my grandfather, Martin Joseph Mm -hmm. McKenna, he wanted to come for a better life. Right. And he was, when, when they came to America, you could only get into America from, um, with if you had a trade. Mm. And he was a bathtub molder, really, a barber, and a brick mason. Mm-hmm. And he got in with his barber license. Right. He opened a barber shop and he made a good life. Yeah. And um, as far as my father's father, John, mm-hmm. he was John as well. Yeah. And I. I think he just came over to um, start a new life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, duck the bullets. <laughs> right, yeah. No, it's, you know, I, I, don't, I, I, I don't know for sure. Though. Right. I don't really know. We don't, we don't talk about it. <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, I'm sure, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure whatever he was doing, he was doing well, what he felt was right. Exactly. They were moral men, and they both wanted to make a better life for themselves and their family. Yeah, and uh, some of my your my your father's uncles were born in Ireland. Some were right, born in right. the United States. Um, because I mean, some of them I had I have gotten to meet. You know, some of them you know passed away before I was born. But I think there was there was Dan, Terry, uh, Mickey, Johnny, who was my grandfather. And uh, and Moss, you know, well, his real name is Maurice, but he went by Moss. Yeah. And uh, did I leave anybody out? Because there were the, the, there was the five of them, and they ha- they had a few sisters as and well. And they had three sisters, so right. there was eight children. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the eldest, um, Dan, Dave, David. Um, All right, right. Yeah, his name was David, the eldest child of uh, your f- grandfather and mm-hmm. my grandmother Nana. Annie Donnelly. Yeah. <clears throat> he went up to get a kite out of a tree for one of his younger brothers and was electrocuted. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah. And and and, yeah. and he, he was killed? In he that? was he was killed. Oh, yeah. my, how old was he? He was he wasn't very old. Oh man. No, he was young. And um, that was a a, a real tragedy cuz his father died as young as my father oh my goodness yeah and he he had a heart attack hmm. and so did my father you know it, it, it always uh it always I, I always find that fascinating because you notice that families were were much bigger years ago yes. and uh i i often wondered if that's because that you know maybe kids weren't not everyone was expected to survive that if, if you got reason. sick and it, it was that was just how it was, you know. The medicine wasn't what no. what it is today, and all those things. So it's and then sometimes you know, depending on if you were in a rural community, you probably needed that many people around to help to help support the family. Exactly. So um, that it, that was that was the reason everybody had bigger families hmm. because they all helped. And in the case of Annie Dunley, all her her boys and her daughters all helped. Yeah, I, I'm always curious about how they. They ended up in Pennsylvania, of all places, outside of outside of Philly. They they started out in Jenkintown. Oh yeah. Yes, and um, your grandfather went to the Christian Brothers School. Yeah. In Jenkintown, and then they they came. They they went to Doylestown, and then they they ended up coming down to Linwood for his job. He worked at Sun Oil Company. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that was a, a very good place to be. At that time, I don't know what he did, but he worked at Sun Oil Company. Yeah. And the only one that really knows the history is Uncle Moss. Right. And yeah, uh, yeah. he would tell you. Yeah. He would be a good interview. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, he's you know he's got to be in his late eighties or or nineties yes. by now, but he's uh, yes. but I mean he's still going strong. Sharp he's still. As a tech. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, that's that's why I always love seeing Uncle Moss because it's like I didn't. Obviously, I didn't get to know my grandfather, yeah. but he's kind of the closest I have on that yeah. side to uh, to getting that. And um, the one thing you would always tell me uh, um, is that all the brothers they would always get together and and sing. Yes. And, and you know, my grandfather and and all you know your uncles, they uh, you know all five of them would get together and sing and 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 harmonize because because um, I know that my dad often plays like old like clips of like the Mills Brothers. 
and stuff from from that era and that they would always sing songs like that and yes. I was uh I I was always um I was always wondering if uh, if the O'Connor brothers ever performed out you know like live in f- for anybody or if it was just a family thing. No, or? they did when they went to clubs. Did they really? People would say, "How about singing for us?" But they at the house. The house was a house of love and a house of music. Sure. My grandmother played the concertina. Oh yeah. My uncle Dan played both the guitar and the piano. Really. And I think one of my I think aunt. Sarah played the piano, but I'm not sure. Yeah. And you never were in the house that you didn't start, they didn't start singing. And their harmony was as close and as accurate as the Mills Brothers. That's cool. It was, it was really phenomenal. I, I was mesmerized and enchanted by it. Well, that's cool. I mean, I, I didn't know that they like performed, like they had gigs. They, they performed out publicly. Well, and, the, well, uh, they, well they were asked to sing. Uh, uh, oh, just like an impromptu kind of thing. <laughs> oh, okay. But still, yeah. still, that's really cool. And it's, yeah. uh, it's just a, it's, it's a shame that, you know, that there yes. aren't any recordings that exist, that exist yes. of, of, um, of what they did back then. It because, really is. Yeah, I mean, what I wouldn't give to to hear what oh, that sounded like. Me too, to hear it again. And, and and that's one of the reasons why I'm glad I have you on here, and I'm gonna get my my mom and dad on here eventually, just because it's like this is a way to kind of document stuff like that, so that yeah. we'll always be able to have it, we'll always be able to listen to it. And um, let me tell you a story about sure. Uncle Moss. Yeah. When he went into the Navy, they he went to the train. Everybody went to the train station to see him off. And they started singing. And my my father, John, said, there wasn't a dry eye oh, in this yeah. station. And the song they sang was, I guess I'll be on my way. Wow. And they said it was absolutely beautiful. Yeah. But he was, he was hanging out the window, and the boys were, you know, right around him. It was fabulous. That's so cool. When, when he went to the Navy, was that before uh, before the war or, or during or World War II? Or? I guess it was, I don't know. I yeah. guess it was during, I don't know. Hmm, maybe, because I mean, I know. I, I know he got his education from the government. So right. Oh, was, that's, yeah, I, yeah. Don't, I don't know what the year was. Or right, right. Well, I, I mean, I know certainly my grandfather, both my grandfathers were, were in the war, but um, yeah. So I, I didn't was know if that was part five of it. Or three. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I was That's... precocious. So I knew oh, everything yeah? that was going on. I'd um, sit on the top step. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> And listen. <laughs> that's that's cool. And um, you know, you talk about how music runs in our family. I, I I'm I mean, I've always been curious about your life as a performer. I mean, because I know that you were a singer and an actress for many years, um, and I'm sure. And I'm sure being around that as a child must have influenced you. Were there any other like actors or singers or performers that as a child that you admired or you wanted to emulate as you grew older? As I grew older? Well, my, my grandfather played the flute. Mm-hmm. And my uncle, Marty, uh, Marty played the, the mandolin. Okay. And uncle, it wasn't Marty. No, it wasn't. I forget who. Played the mandolin. And we would always start singing. Mm-hmm. Singing was part of our core. Yeah. It really was. Uncle Jimmy played the mandolin. Okay. And he also played for the the, the string bands. Oh, okay. Yeah, in, in Philadelphia. Oh, cool. But I started singing when I was about five years old publicly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Do you, do you remember the first time you sang in front of a uh, in front of people like outside of the family well, publicly? Well, all the family said, you know, I was always being put up somewhere, and I would sing. And the first song I sang was Accentuate the Positive. Ah, okay. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> Eliminate. And I've been, I remember being stood up on a table by Betty Wiggins mm-hmm. in a bowling alley. And singing, you know, I was just, Aww. I just loved it. I just loved to <laughs> sing. But in school, we were fortunate enough to have little operettas. And uh, it, it, was, it was a fabulous time. You're in like, in like plays and in musicals plays, and stuff. Yes. Yeah. And I was always anxious to be part of it. Yeah. And I did. And then um, as after that, I went to work. And then I joined the um, Candlelight Dinner Theater. Yeah. And I did, you know, stage productions of Camelot, 
mm-hmm. you know, Maine. Th- th- this was after high school that this you were in? This was after high school. But during high school, I sang with a band mm-hmm. and uh, made some money. And then one summer, I auditioned for summer stock. My mother took me up to Philadelphia, and I made it. Was In Philadelphia, they would have the tents. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I made it, and it was just wonderful. But I didn't want to travel with them. I was. You didn't want to go on the road, I didn't or want anything to go like on that. The road. So the man who was the musical director, his name was Joel DePolis, mm-hmm. but his stage name was Joel Scott. Okay. And uh, I started singing with his band, and we did all country clubs. And it was it was fabulous. Very cool. Yeah. So I mean, when when you were singing in some of these bands, you, you mainly do like um, the, like the country clubs standards. and yeah. Yes, private clubs, dinner parties, and the old standards. Like a lot of like jazz standards yes, or uh, yeah, I loved jazz. Yeah. Uh, what what were some of your favorite songs to sing back well, then? Well, some of my favorite songs were uh, what is the name of that song that I just uh, Tangerine. Okay. We had an arrangement of Tangerine that was just great. Do you re- do you know that? I, I I don't know if I'm familiar with Tangerine, that one. Tangerine, mm. she is all they say. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's a really really good. I'll, song. I'll have to look it up for yeah, sure. Yeah, I have to look it up. Yeah, I mean, were were there any like you know, I mean, when you were younger, obviously you knew you wanted to be a performer. Were there any like singers that you were a fan of growing up, like uh, like like um. Just different performers, like I guess, like Judy Garland or someone like that. Or yes, I love Judy Garland, but I loved Helen O'Connell. Okay. And uh, she's the one who sang Tangerine. Oh, okay. And we used to watch um, uh, shows on television, and every time, like, you know, it was Ed Sullivan. And yeah. All yeah. those performers and everything, but somehow I don't know how I got into it, but I was just fascinated by it, mm-hmm. and uh, I. I went to a dance studio, Brooks Durham, Mm -hmm. who was a stand-in for Fred Astaire. Really? Yes. And that's where I met my dear friend, Doreen Kupchik. Yeah, yeah. And so we always had, you know, dance lessons and everything. And he's the one who used to put on shows. And prior to him, Vicki Parks, we would go to different uh, mental institutes and hospitals and perform for the patients patients. wow yeah so it was you know we would sing and dance and were they they usually a good crowd they were a very good (laughs) crowd yes good very very well well well-mannered and very good crowd so uh, but we i would sing at the drop of a hat very cool it was good (sighs) so um yeah the the funny thing is my um, favorite my favorite stage production mm-hmm. was My Fair Lady. My Fair Lady. Did you play Eliza? Uh, yes. Wow. I was Eliza. <laughs> Thank you. How kind of you to let me come. Right, right. <laughs> Did you have any trouble learning doing the accent and all no. that? Or, yeah, just got right into the it. Cock- That's great. The cockney came to me. Right, easily. right. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. So it was. It I, was um, great. Yeah, I mean. Um, I yeah. did Finian's Rainbow. Okay. I did A Man for All Seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, cabaret. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you came to one of the children's. I got into children's theater too. Did you? Yeah. I because I, I don't know. I, I Maybe mean, it was no. I think you were too young. I think it was Jay who came to the children's theater. Probably. I know. Um, I you know I I, I don't remember because I know a lot. You know, a lot of times like after I was born, I know you didn't really do it as much, but. Um, but like I remember being, you know, when I was a little kid, and I'd go out for plays and stuff. And um, at one point, I, I did something at the Delaware Children's Theater in Wilmington, and there was a lady there named Marie Swajeski. Yes. She was, and she knew you. I mean, yes. she would come up to me. You're, you're Maureen O'Connor's nephew. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah I am. I'm like, how do you know her? So, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So I mean, I, I would hear stuff like that. You know, just kind of mm-hmm. from like you know meeting some of these, you know, you know some of the folks, you know, sort of in that circle so it, it was always something I found interesting um, I, you know th- there's something about performing and I don't and, and I think that's what you and I have always kind of understood without really saying it that 
even though you can be sort of a quiet person, there's something about if you're into performing that can like break through that wall of self-consciousness. And I know that that's certainly been the case for me. Was was it like that for you when 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 you were growing up? I, I always found it to be a very very euphoric experience. Right. And uh, I wasn't I wasn't particularly shy, but I just got in. I used to love the rehearsals. Yeah. And the shows, and it was it always it found. A little spot in me that was fulfilled. Right. You know, I, you and I talked about a vocation and a vocation. Yes. And I always had a job. Mm hmm. But my avocation was always the theater. And that was, I mean, you know, that's always been one of the pieces of advice you gave me that it's okay to have a vocation, which is your day job. Yes. But your avocation is something that you're passionate about. Yes. And even if, even if you're not necessarily as passionate about you know your day job what you you know what you got an education for what you do professionally that you should still pursue your avocation yes. you know something you're passionate about and that's something that I, I've always took to heart yes. and it's definitely been one of the best pieces of advice I've used throughout my life and um, so I mean that that's you know I think that's definitely something I think anyone listening to is to this, especially anyone who's younger, who's may, maybe doesn't have that sort of um, that sort of advice. So hopefully, they can take that away from from our conversation that we're having right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Um, when you were, you know, when you were doing this, um, was there? Did you ever have like aspirations of like fame and fortune? Like, did you want to be on TV or, or Broadway? Was that something that you had gone after? Or? Uh, financially, I couldn't do that. Uh, my father died so young, mm -hmm. and but I don't know that I really would have done it even if he hadn't died. But um, I did. I, I did do a show with uh, the Philadelphia in Philadelphia called Anything Goes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I would take the train up at night and all. And this gentleman, Jack Stack, was his name. Mm -hmm. And he he wanted to take the show on the road, but it was a, I I never went I never mm -hmm. went with it because I didn't want it I I had to make some money right you know so I had a job at Sun Oil so that's what I what I did but like if someone back then came up to you be like hey Ma Maureen we have a um, we have an offer for um, a, a TV pilot or we have an offer for um, you know a starring role on Broadway if I something like taken it. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I mean, I, I again, I didn't know if that was something you was, had aspired to be because I've met people who like playing music and like performing but aren't really comfortable with maybe the fame or, or, or the, the commercial aspect of it, which I, I understand. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a good, honest answer. Absolutely. And because, um, you know, and, and we had touched on this earlier. I know that through most of my life, you, you hadn't really done it too much. And I was always curious about that because, you know, I often look at my own life and my desire to make it as a guy in a band, to be a successful musician or a rock star or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, I, I honestly know that at some point I will have to accept that I might not necessarily take this as far as I want it to go because the entertainment business is very difficult to get into. And the older I get, the harder the harder it will be. I know that that window will close eventually, and um, you know, and, and that that that's going to take some some getting used to, obviously. But was there was there a point uh, in your career that you ever felt that it was maybe time to stop or to move on to something else in your life? I'll tell you the reason I stopped. I I got a job at Dupont. And I was in marketing, and travel was required. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't commit. I did a lot of shows at the Three Bakers. The Three Little Bakers. The Three Little Bakers Dinner Theater, Dinner yeah, Theater. in Wilmington, Delaware. And that was a three-month stint. Mm -hmm. So when you signed up, you were there for three you months. You had to commit for it. You mm -hmm. had to commit for it. Yeah. And uh, so I wasn't able to continue mm -hmm. it. And then from there on, it just kind of slipped away. Yeah. But, uh, so it's just, it's just, I mean, you know, kind of the work... 
ended yeah. up taking over. So yes. it wasn't wasn't necessarily your choice. It was just the circumstances, circumstances you were yes. in. So, but I mean, obviously, you did you 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 got to do a lot of what oh, you wanted to do. A lot. So I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure you weren't too upset about it. No, I wasn't at the time because my job was very interesting, mm -hmm. and I traveled. And what, was, what did you do for Dupont? I managed the interior designers, mm. and first in the in the residential group, and then with the commercial group, mm. and it was it was just a great great opportunity. Started out as a secretary, mm -hmm. and. Um, then I, I moved up because that wasn't my first job. Prior to that, I worked with a man in uh, Jack, his name was Jack as well, and he did industrial shows. So I, I w we would write songs, sing songs. One song I wrote, it's uh, uh, Blue, Sentimental and Blue. I'll have to oh, give yeah. you the lyrics yeah. sometime and have you record it. <laughs> but um, we would do shows for big industries. It was so we had the Southern Gas Association. Uh, we we did a it was a rear production rear uh, production rear projection. Okay. On a big screen, and then the whole show advertised their product. So it was a very creative, very uh, fashion forward and head and ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. But uh, he died, and then I left him. But I was, it was, it was a great, great job. And then I went to DuPont. So, uh, but I, I did writing, and it was just wonderful. I've had so many blessings in my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, I don't know why, but I just have, my angel has watched over me. <laughs> Absolutely. Do you, have, uh, do you have any regrets or things you wish you did a little bit differently along the way? In retrospect, I think I could have done things maybe a little different, yes. But I'm grateful for all the opportunities I had. Absolutely. And, and that's life. I mean, you know, we make choices in life and that leads us to Growth. where we are and it makes us the, the people that we turn out to be. Yes. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that you did interior design for the DuPont company because when you met your husband, my uncle Ken, yes. Uh, you both worked for the New York Carpet World Company. Yes. And you guys had lived, I mean, I, I know over the years, you guys have lived pretty much all over the country. All over the world. Yes. I think first you moved to, to Michigan, to uh, West Bloomfield, Michigan, outside of Detroit. And uh, I know at one point you were in Atlanta. Yes. Uh, you were br briefly in northern New Jersey for a little bit. Yes. Uh, you were out in near like Honeyman Beach, California, or Newport Beach. Newport Beach, yeah. And uh, and now you guys split your time between Tucson and Aspen, Colorado. Yes. So did I did I leave anywhere out or? I don't uh... think so. We did move seven times. Yeah. <laughs> Twice back to Atlanta. Right. With a job. Yeah. Yeah. It was something. And now, uh, now, I mean, I guess Uncle Ken, I think he still works for the Home Depot no, company, no, or, now, or, or no? Or, now he works for. He's a uh, market representative for Laloy Rugs. Okay. And they're based in Dallas, Texas. Gotcha. So, yeah. But he, he's had an interesting career. Mm -hmm. He actually named Stainmaster. Like he came up with the name yeah, Stainmaster? Yeah, that, that was the name, Stainmaster. And there was a man in Jersey, North Jersey, that had that name. So Ken sent a, a lawyer to North Jersey and said, see what he wants for the the rights to the name mm -hmm. and uh but he said there's a ceiling you know on how much you can spend but right. see what he wants he wanted fifty thousand dollars they gave it to him and dupont took the name that was nothing wow at the time he kind of got hosed on that deal he should <laughs> I should probably lawyer Maybe up, get I some money. Have said that. <laughs> no, that's fine. They're not, they're not going to be listening to this. Come on. Yeah. But uh, but that's that's fascinating. Now, did he work for for Dupont when you guys met? Yes. Oh, okay, yeah. so that's how you guys met originally yes. was through work. Yeah. And he was I mean, he's from Minnesota originally, he's or from Chicago. Or, oh, no, he's from Chicago. I knew he was from Midwest, Midwest. somewhere. But uh, I yeah. kind of get that. He went mixed to Northwestern. Up. And he, he's a, a chemist, research chemist. Okay. And then he went to University of Delaware mm -hmm. and got his master's in finance 
and uh, marketing. Yeah. So uh, he's an interesting man. Very cool. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's uh, you know, it's interesting how you guys have lived um, lived all across the country. And you know, I mean, despite that, that has never really affected our relationship with each other. No. And. I look at, you know, because my sister has two little ones right now, and I remember when her first was born, I remember coming to you and be like, you know, Aunt Maureen, I just want to say, um, you know, I guess now that I'm an uncle officially, that I hope that I have the relationship with them that you do with me. And and certainly I do with all my other aunts and uncles as well. But you you and I have always had a unique thing. We've had a unique thread. and, and, and And I think it's an important thing because, you know, and that's the thing about, you know, maybe if you live somewhere else, even though you're not necessarily around all the time, that doesn't mean you can't be a, an important part of their lives. Right. And that's kind of what I want to do with, you know, with Nora and Paulina and uh, and certainly what you've done with Mary Rose and I and all our other cousins. So it's uh, so it's definitely it's definitely a good example to look up to. And I, you know, I'm glad that. I'm glad that we have been able to keep in touch the way we have over the years and that I'm always able to call you whenever I need something or, you know, or whenever I just need someone to talk to or get your advice on something. So it's, uh, so, I mean, obviously I have my own parents as well. And vice versa, Jack, you've always, you, you speak so eloquently. You've always given me inspiration. Well, that's good. I mean, that's, you know, obviously, you know, and like one of the things we talk about is just sort of the way the world is now. Yes. And I know you've experienced a lot in your life and you've seen the world go through major changes. And, you know, you look at, you know, I mean, I know you weren't really familiar with podcasting or, you know, digital culture and all that stuff. And, um, but, um, I, I was always curious, do you think with everything you've seen in your life, do you think the world we live in has, sort of changed for the better or the worse and i'm sure there have been pros and cons but you know what's i mean what's sort of your take on you know society today and how it's evolved well society in general has always been in my opinion very very good good to me uh we we were not wealthy but we were rich yeah and we had that tight family core and that fight to, uh, tight family experience and your family experience molds you for what's ahead in life absolutely you had the same thing you know parents that love you and siblings that love you it's it's just it's something you can't put into words yeah and today i feel i feel very sorry for the children of today a lot of them are one parent families. Mm-hmm. The mothers have to work, and there's also the fathers that are raising the children. Yeah. It isn't just the mothers, and they have to work, and the children are left alone. When I was growing up, my mother didn't work, and it made a big difference. But then, after my father died, of course, God bless her, she went yeah. to work. But I think that's part of the reason. For the disconnect, yeah, and um, there's so much information available to so many children, and a lot of it isn't good. The violence, yeah, you know, the negativity, um, and they're too young to absorb it and to call out what is important, and they they just absorb all this negativity, and I think. It has had an effect on the, on the world. I I would agree. I mean, um, you know, I think for for all the good that has been done, um, certainly in our country and and all around the world, um, there is still, you know, there there are things that we've lost. Yes. I think that my generation and the, the the generation that is coming up after, you know, the young kids today, um, you know, I, I I do feel like there is a little bit of a disconnect there, and whether it's you know you call it traditional values or or you know just you know what what it means to be a family nowadays it's uh, it's it's, it's a it's a difficult world for kids to grow up in today and i mean not not that it was necessarily the easiest when when i was a little kid or even when when you were but um you know it, it, it there's a lot of information out there there are a lot of good things but i think with that comes some baggage 
And, um, and but I'd like to think, you know, I mean, I think you and I are are also both very optimistic in that we yes. believe that most yes. people, a majority of people, are inherently good. Absolutely. I think we're all we're all born good. We all yes. come into this world the same, yes. and it's we're a product of our environment. It's yeah, who we, situational who, yeah. environment. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think we're very lucky to have been have grown up in the time and place that we have and yes. to have the, be surrounded by the people that we've we've been surrounded with yes. and i think that 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 shapes us and i think as long as you know my, my dad said something in, to the effect where it's like one of the one of the key um one of the most important i guess um foundations of a free society is the family because you know i i guess you you know, I don't know if it goes into that whole "it takes a village to raise a child" kind of thing. I don't know. I don't know how true that is, but I do know that, you know, a lot of people I know um, who don't have the the type of family that we do um, have suffered for it, and uh, I, I I definitely, you know, I I don't, I don't necessarily pity, but I I do feel sorry for people who haven't had that experience. Yes, it's it's a gift. And. Um, but I've also seen a lot of people kind of turn it around, turn their lives around, and, yes. and make changes for the better out of that. And you know, so I mean, it, it, it is there is Look hope at ben there. Ben Carson, yeah, <laughs> he's a perfect example. Yeah, he was very impoverished. Was he? Yeah. His mother raised him. Yeah, and he and his brother, his brother's an engineer, I believe, and he's a neurosurgeon. That, I mean, that's a great story. Yeah. So I mean, you hear about stuff like that all the time. For for all the negative that that seems to get the most attention, there there is there are a lot of good things that maybe slip through the cracks. But that people, you know, pe- maybe the media should broadcast that a little bit more. I wish they would. Yeah. I wish they would give some positive input. Definitely. So um, this has been awesome. I'm 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 really glad that we got the chance to sit down and do this. Me too. And uh, you know, hopefully, I'm sure. You know, who knows? We might do it again one of these days. And you know, there's always something to talk about. But I was glad that you were able to kind of sit down and tell your story. And I think people are going to get a kick out of that. And I'm glad you gave me some time with you alone. Of course, it's wonderful. Of course, I love it. And whenever, you know, Jack. We... Even though we're not close physically or geographically, geographically, yeah. geographically, we're never far away. Exactly. And when we talk, we pick up right where we left off. Exactly. There's never any space. No, there there really isn't. Uh-uh. So, um, so this has been great. Um, before we, uh, you know, I think before we go, uh, any final thoughts or fi- any final advice or anything you'd like to say? Uh, follow your own dreams. Have faith in yourself. That, that, that's good. <laughs> and have faith. Keep keep the faith. Absolutely. And keep the faith. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I, I couldn't have said it any better myself. And uh, and I know there. I, and I know you've uh, you've mentioned that you and Uncle Ken might be considering moving to Florida yes. in the next few years. Yes. That would be uh, that would be pretty awesome. We would be even closer. Yeah, to have a little bit less of that geographical distance. Yes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, hopefully you know, knock on wood, that'll happen. But um, but e- either way, you know, I'm glad that we're able to do this and always pick up wherever we leave off, wherever yes. we might be. So. Um, thank you, uh, Maureen O'Connor Petke, for uh, for being on the show with me. Thank you, Jack James <laughs> O'Connor. <laughs> it, it, uh, that, that, that's my mom in the background joining in. <laughs> Beautiful. It, it, well done. Is, is it weird that I that I dropped the O from the stage name or? Uh, I I <laughs> like the fact that you did. <laughs> I, I was always worried about that, and uh, well, you know, I, my stage name was Sinjin Carlisle. Right, right, <laughs> right, right, right. You could use it if you want. Uh, yeah. Well, I think it's probably best to retire Sinjin. Uh, I don't even know how you spell Sinjin. It's, uh, it's, it's actually Saint John. Oh, all but right. It's, Sinjin it's, Smythe. <laughs> Sinjin Carlisle. I, I think that was from a Bond movie. <laughs> yeah. I think it's S Y N J O N. Maybe. Yeah. That's hilarious. See, see, I mean, mine, mine isn't too bad. All I did was drop the yo. You kind of went and you oh, really went for it I back then. I went for it. Big time. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Aunt Mo. Thank Appreciate you, it. honey. God bless you. All right. Oh, man. What an amazing podcast. Thank you guys for listening to that. Thank you to my Aunt Maureen for doing that. Uh, Aunt Mo, as I like to call her. 
Um, yeah, just an amazing guest and just one of my favorite people on the planet. She, um, she just had just really an amazing life story and is just one of, uh, certainly one of my biggest, uh, supporters. So I was really glad to get her on here to kind of tell her story and, uh, just to tell where she had come from and sort of give a background as, you know, her, you know, her past as a performer, as a singer and actress, and uh, what she ended up doing uh, after that career was over was equally as interesting, I thought. Uh, yeah, so I, I recorded that about two weeks ago, um, maybe two or three weeks ago, uh, when she was uh, at my parents' house. And um, so I, I've been really busy, so I'm just now getting to post it. I know I've been running a little bit late on uh, some of the postings, so I apologize for that, but... Um, Hopefully you enjoyed this uh, this conversation. I really enjoyed doing it, and uh, yeah, I would absolutely have her back because she's just uh, she's just an amazing person, and I'm glad to have people in my family on. And who knows? I might even get my parents on, maybe my sister, or who, who, you know, maybe you know someone else in my family. You never know. I'm sure they're listening right now. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so we'll see, but um, but that was really cool to have my aunt Maureen on, and thank you for listening. As far as our next show with Vertebraker, it will be Saturday, October 17th at the Boondocks Live in Melbourne, uh, presented by Blind Anxiety Entertainment. We will be there with Seven Stone Riot, Emerge, Detached, and Best Supporting Actor. Uh, it is an all-ages show, so um, you know it's just $5 to get in the door. So yeah, definitely don't miss uh, that don't miss that show if you're in the area. It should be a great one. Uh, a week after that, we will be playing at the Haven Lounge in Winter Park, uh, which is just outside of Orlando. Uh, that's one of our favorite places to play. We haven't been there in over a year. That show will be presented by Breakout Artist Management Group. Uh, we will be playing there with uh, Ghost in the Attic, uh, who are here from Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, along with our good friends Vilify. Uh, and there will be several other bands there as well. Uh, it will be Mink Mob, Stonebone, Only You, uh, Vertebreaker, of course, uh, Sweet Oblique, Fighting the Silence, and Flakeskate. So uh, definitely a lot of music on that show. I hope uh, hope we have enough of a set time where uh, we're, we have a decent amount of um, amount of time to play for you guys. So uh, yeah, there there will be a lot of music there. Uh, hopefully uh, hopefully the set times won't be too short. But even if they are, you get sort of a uh, Whitman sampler of uh, of all these different bands. So definitely come on out if you're in the Orlando area. It should be a great night. Um, as always, make sure you check out the Alleycore Central Florida Local Rock documentary. Uh, go to alleycore.com. That's A-L-I-K-O-U-R.com. I think we're still doing some crowdsource uh, fundraising for that. That's going to be a great documentary featuring us along with Traverser, Soul Switch, Murderfly, and Mechanism. So definitely check that out if you get the chance. And, uh, and yeah, so that's it for, uh, for this episode. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at JackXConnor. Like me on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash JackConnorMusic. Also, definitely check out the band at www.vertebreaker.net. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, make sure you email me at JackConnorPodcast at gmail.com or tweet me with the hashtag PhoenixReport. And if you're listening to this on YouTube or iTunes, make sure you subscribe, leave a comment, go back, listen to all the other episodes, and uh, that'll be it. So thank you for listening. This has been the Phoenix Report with Jack Connor on the TwoBadBrains.com.